I'm sorry, do you just run up to people in the street and ask them why they exist? Is it, it's like, oh is my it? god, Gretchen, you can't just ask people why they're white. <laughs> That, that is a perfect example of it why is. you can't do that. It is. You just... King we built ourselves a fort, and we lay us deep down underneath the sun. Stay, stay inside the kind of space as I touch you. Our recording sessions with Klaus are coming to an end soon, and we would be grateful if you could send us any questions you may have about this topic along with any comments, so that we may incorporate that Q&A session we talked about earlier. Please email us at geometricoctopus at gmail.com. The following is a short list of trigger warnings for this episode. Surgery, ostracization, homophobia, transphobia, violence towards people of the LGBT community, and hypermasculinity. Please be a responsible listener. It seems as though I need to be getting back to our cave. I would like it if you join me and the rest of the group for episode 4, Skewed Images. media and films if you would like i'd like to talk about the film about ray that was going to be coming out i'm not sure if it's actually come out yet or not i mm. boycotted it so i don't really care Mm-mm. beyond the point that i know what it's about <laughs> Wait, what's it called the film was called about ray and um to date it's basically been one of two films that have featured a teenage transgender ma- male hmm. And um, the reason wow, that there was... that's not a lot. Yeah, tell me about it. That's not a lot at all. Wow. When we, when we actually talk about that kind of representation, it becomes very, very slim. And there's a bunch of reasons why there's a difference between representative transgender women, transgender men, and transgender non-binary people. And there's a lot of disparity with that. Mm-hmm. But what, oh. what was actually happening with About Ray is that this film was in... <sighs> the way it's marketed is that it's a film about a transgender boy... In his teenage years, and he's seeking to transition. But his parents are separated, and if you guys don't know this, um, in order to transition as a minor, you have to have parental permission. And in the case of Ray, he had to go find his dad, basically, who he had not spoken to in years. That's so... See? It's ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah. It is. It's it's, it's complicated when it comes to that kind of issue and such, but... (sighs) It's hard to think about. Because if you're like 13 years old mm. and your parents are separated and you need permission from both of them, yeah. In the, in the case of like my family's been my family's been split since I was seven, and if I were to be if even if even if I was in a situation where like as a minor I would have to go to my mother and if my mother were to say like okay fine I'd still have to go find my dad. That's nice. And you know in a lot of cases families separate for really good reasons, especially because sometimes mm. like family that you're not living with is not a good caretaker. Mm. 
But you know, re- regardless of this issue, we're actually talking. We'd like to talk about the actual like movie. The reason why this movie ended up being boycotted. What this movie, the first thing this movie did wrong, was not actually its casting of a cisgender female person to play Ray, a transgender guy. Which was, of course, a major issue. We, the idea of that you can cast cis people as trans people is incredibly harmful. And just in the case of there be, if it, if it enforcing the idea that they're actually just cis, like a trans guy is actually just a cis woman. And there are a great many transgender actors in Hollywood who are attempting to find jobs, including transgender actors who have not begun physically transitioning yet, or transgender actors who are even willing to physically detransition uh, for a short period of time during filming. Wow. Absolutely. And this is something that we just... It, it, it absolutely removes the idea that we can, like, oh, well, it's okay that we cast this cis person to play this trans person because, well, we have a, what about... Trans people, we don't want to make them transition, or we don't make them not detrain. It's just, it's just false. There's no reason for it. And that same kind of issue showed up with Dallas Buyers Club and the casting of a cis man to play a trans woman who was also treated incredibly poorly in that film. I don't want to talk about that film. I hate that film. Which one? <sighs> Dallas Buyers Club. I need to hate it too. <laughs> <laughs> you hit me up uh, later. I'll, I'll, I'll write you an essay about it. Oh, okay. I'll just forward you the essay I did write about it. <laughs> yeah, but then, oh, sorry. I'm trying to remember, have you touched on yet how, in particular, the um, the director of the movie... Yes, I wanted to talk yeah. about that next. Yeah. The director of this film um, came out and said that her story was not about a transgender guy. And that was the reasoning behind casting a cis woman to play him. And Wait, what, what she actually said was that... <laughs> was that this character, Ray, was... Basically, he said... She said that he wasn't a guy, that he that this character wasn't actually transgender. This person's just confused. This person is just whoa. going through this process, whoa, whoa. like trying to seek this new identity or something or exploring his identity. And it's just not true. And he... I have to get something straight. So, this so that's movie, what the director was trying to do. Get movie, something straight. Yeah, that's what I'm... <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> uh, I know I noticed the joke and I tried to slip past it, but then you had to bring it up. Okay, okay, okay. So... Let me get this clear. <laughs> the director is pretty much trying... The director is trying to make a point, or maybe not trying to, but will end up making that point, whether they want to or not, by saying that anyone who is seeking transition is delusional. So that's pretty much what the message is, is that don't do it because you're just confused. Or that that's... people who do this are confused. That's pretty much what... It Regardless like of saying. what this director wanted to like to convey, yeah. it's going to be it's going to be complicated because part of the original outcry against this was like this character Ray was using the narrative "I'm a guy trapped in a girl's body," which is something that some people identify with and some people don't, and especially but especially when it's used by a cisgendered person to describe tra- the transgender experience, it's not typically seen as okay. But because this was the issue that came out first about this film. A lot of people started to, dis- to discount other criticisms of the film, which was really unfortunate because there actually are a lot of things that are wrong with this film from a representational pr- perspective. And yes, the director was absolutely wrong. The director was absolutely not in the moral high ground about this. But there are still people who want to see it because that's how scarce representation is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And honestly, wow. I almost wish that I'd seen it just for the sake of like seeing it and being able to make this call of like, well, okay, this is good representation, this is bad representation, but I can't because that means that I'm contributing to the idea that no matter what kind of representation we get, it's okay because, you know, that's what's going to succeed. Well, I'm not going to explicitly um, say that you should do this because we're on air and I, you know, I don't want to necessarily get involved in that, but... There are ways of watching these films without <laughs> uh, benefiting the directors. Yes, and these hypothetical ways are, in fact, a thing that could possibly be done by an individual who wished to do that. And if that individual were to do that, they would, in fact, be bypassing the entire reasoning behind not seeing it for that purpose of capitalistic in- income. And so we're not However, saying do it. However, we personally <laughs> are not going to do this at any point and never have. Never will. Yeah, never have. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Let's go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so... There's still so much to cover, guys. Please. Can you <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> continue okay. on with this. So, yeah. let's just... Let's 
keep going. Let's, we uh, were talking about how um, we were, well, we were the, this media. concept of some people believe that any representation is better than no representation. Mm-hmm. And if yeah. you and if you look at stuff like that, you've also got uh, films like uh, Stonewall, which Absolutely. ended up being completely critically panned, partly because um, Stonewall, from the information that we have on it, which we do have quite a few, and from firsthand accounts, we know that the vast majority of the people who did, you know, the vast majority of the stuff at Stonewall were, in fact, uh, transgender women of color. And in the film, the person who is leading the charge, the person who threw the first brick, is a white, cisgender, gay male. And the thing about Stonewall is Stonewall was the bar in that district, which was a very gay district. (laughs) Um, It was the gay bar in that district where the people who were not really welcome in the other bars went to, so it was mostly a congregation place for, say, transgender women of color. So putting in that film this sort of, number one, a sort of white savior style character, but number two, even the director said that it was essentially intended to be a self-insert for the audience so that they'd so that straight people, straight white people who went to the movie would be able to envision <laughs> themselves as the hero. <laughs> what the? <laughs> well, bless you. <laughs> Gesundheit. Thank you. Just the comedic break we needed, I guess. <laughs> but again, this is a director who's yeah. saying stuff that's really not cool and one of the things that happened with this movie is it did end up getting critically panned because in most of the sources that i saw even on sources that were from sites that were you know just movie review sites not even lgbt movie review sites they tended to say yeah this movie is taking something and putting this insert for the audience and it just completely takes the piss out of the movie (laughs) And I think it was it was really interesting to see so many people have this idea that no representation is better than terrible representation. When we talk about that kind of issue, it becomes it becomes complicated. And I've yeah. also heard it, I've heard it from um, uh, native activists who have talked about like, well, having some kind of representation, having some kind of knowledge in people's minds, like ha- I think people have a concept of, in this case, when I was talking to this person, this person yeah. was talking about ha- people having a concept of what Native Americans were like from, say, like spaghetti westerns or like John Wayne movies, stuff like spaghetti that. Spaghetti westerns? Gory westerns. <laughs> okay. I, you I never heard the no, term spaghetti western? I have not heard the term spaghetti western before. It, yeah, it's different. Um, Papyrus, is that you? <laughs> can we leave that in, or do we have to take that out? I think we can leave that in. I think that would be something that the, the creator would be cool with. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, like, honestly, what I'm envisioning here is papyrus on a horse. <laughs> um, which makes no sense to people who have no idea what we're talking uh, about. <laughs> this is a reference to a video game called Undertale, in which there's a character named Papyrus who is a skeleton who loves and is rather bad at cooking pasta. <laughs> so play it. Yeah, do it. Do it. <laughs> Support that game. And, and we're not we are not getting paid for this. There's ad, a lot of so... non-binary representation. Play it. <laughs> They're actually that's a really cool thing about that game is play it. <laughs> it's good non-binary representation. It is. It's Many of good. the characters are given um not only they them pronouns um but even even many of the characters who are portrayed as probably uh cisgender or mm. are portrayed as binary individuals have wildly varying gender presentations gender presentations you have canonically male coded characters who use he him pronouns that tend to wear very feminine clothing including dresses which is something that you very rarely see in media for anything other than a comedic effect and in this Mm. case it's not really for a comedic effect 
Absolutely. And I think probably the the thing that thrilled me the most about this game was the fact that we don't see the main characters having a gender. This character is referred to consistently through the game as using they, them. And it's really just, it's so quality to have this character that you don't have to worry about like, oh God, am I going to have to, am I going to have to pretend this character? I'm going to project myself into this character. This character is canonically non-binary and no one cares. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> one of the great things about having a non-binary character like that is even if you're a binary person, you can insert yourself into that character. You can see yourself as that character without having to gender bend that character in your mind because that character is non-binary. It's not... We really don't have to, like... When yeah. when we're talking about projecting yourself into main character, which is really... It shouldn't matter to a person whether or not they get, like, oh, this character's non-binary and I'm not. I shouldn't have to worry. It, it, it's... It, it, you it should be able shouldn't. to project yourself into a character that has human characteristics. You really like this person's characteristics or, like, you can... Oh, in this case, we probably shouldn't really be enjoying the characteristics of certain versions of this character. That's a very specific one. <laughs> Please don't be that character. Um, <laughs> but when we're talking about, like, specifically Frisk, there shouldn't be an issue with projecting yourself into Frisk because Frisk is just a person. Because in, it, um, not doing so would be considering that, that particular character is, you know, you're dehumanizing it, saying yeah. you can't relate to it just because of, you know, some type of weird, you know relationship with you and your own gender it's like why you have to freak out about this this was the same kind of scenario that happened when like uh it was samus that was real she was that uh, she was transgender and i saw that already. yeah the, the, the massive outcry of dude bro tears oh. was not it was very like it was kind of funny just to watch but in reality it's also kind of scary it makes no sense why people had to get upset yeah it's like, what are and... you crying about you've been playing as this character forever <laughs> Yeah, it was, and it's it's especially an interesting thing to see because oh, they can they can believe that this character has had all these surgeries done to them by uh, aliens and just so much other stuff in the story canonically, but the one thing that they can't abide by is that this character is transgender and that that was one of the surgeries that was done to them to, you know, help them by the alien owl thingies. <laughs> uh, they were. They were alien you. they were alien owl thingies. I can't remember their names right now. Oh wow, well, we're a bunch of faked gamers over here. <laughs> we are We are going to have a pause and Cosmo is going to edit back in the name <laughs> of these alien things. And it's gonna sound super fake. <laughs> Three, two one. The term Chozo is used to refer to a race of owl-like creatures that inhabit the game world of Metroid. Known to be generous and yet mysterious, they kept a balance between technology and spiritualism that became characteristic to their culture. The original Japanese term for Chozo translates to Birdman race. Okay, <laughs> now that we know the name of these alien beings, I'm so fresh. we're going to move on, so we're going to talk about them anymore. It's so fresh in our memory. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. And you see this, you actually, you see that in video games even outside of transgender representation. You see mm. that in video games even if they put in a female character or a non-white character. There was a thing with Shepard being portrayed oh, as the yeah. female voice. Just that was extremely <laughs> recently. There was uh, in a Mass Effect trailer. There was a Commander Shepard character was portrayed with a female voice because in the games you can make your Commander Shepard character be either female or male. Obviously, there we have a representation of the binary, but eh. it's better than nothing. <laughs> Which yeah. is one of those issues where I'm going to go with, with, with mediocre is better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. You did but, the bare minimum. Congratulations. <laughs> but having her in the trailer, having a female version of this character in the trailer, when in previous trailers the character has been voiced by a male, has gotten quite a few people up in arms and <laughs> had quite a few people be very, very angry. Which is something that I find interesting because it's legitimately a game mechanic that you can make your character be female. 
And you see that in other games as well, and I'm going to be talking about uh, particularly um, uh, sexuality representation as opposed mm. to uh, gender representation. If they include uh, options in, in games where they include options to romance certain characters or they have characters that are romantically linked, there tends to be an outcry if those romantic options or those romantically linked characters are gay or bisexual because they feel that these characters are shoehorned in, which is really interesting because obviously the only people in this world that exist are straight white males. It's, it's so interesting to see the outcry against this. It's like, well, why did this character have to be gay? Or why did this character have to be a woman? Why did this character have to be bisexual? And it's like, I'm sorry, do you just run up to people in the street and ask them why they exist? It's, it's like, oh <laughs> my God, Gretchen, you can't just ask people why they're white. <laughs> Oh, I love that. God, that, that is a perfect example of it why is. you can't do that. It is. You just, it's not, <laughs> not it? everyone is one way. And in fact, one of the interesting things that I find is the most vocal part of the video game, part of people who like video games tend to be straight, white, cisgender males. However... Yes, however. The vast majority of gamers are actually female. Over are the age of 18. Oh, well, over the age of 18 are no, actually female. Additionally, it's a, when, the percentage of, of women over the age of 18 vastly, 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 vastly. outnumbers the percentage of gamers that are males under the age of 18, which... It is interesting because the vast majority of people portrayed as being video game players are males under the age of 18. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. males over the age of 40. Also that. <laughs> but yeah. that's a joke. <laughs> but in that in you have you have quite stuff. a few people who get um who get very angry over these issues, but then you also have the fact that many people who are gamers and this is including this is including both console gamers and PC gamers. In fact, uh, in fact, lot. in the studies, <laughs> of them. in fact, in the studies that um, have been done, it's been exclusively. Um, there have been studies done on exclusively console owners, such as Xbox or PlayStation Nintendo. or PlayStation, Nintendo, not including uh, not not including cell phones, which are another game platform. <laughs> yeah, but. Then they've like also done on uh, computer computer gamers, and most computer gamers are in fact girls, but they're not they're not vocal about it. And one of the reasons why is because particularly online, there's a massively toxic environment. Yeah, no um, that just makes everybody think, oh yeah, no, all gamers are guys because these guys try to make it a boys' club. It's the same thing with mm. comics. If you are a girl going into this situation, you have to deal with so much backlash for just just for your gender. For existing somewhere. <laughs> absolutely. There are so mad absolutely that you exist. <laughs> just for your gender. You're forced to you're forced to prove yourself, in fact. It's like running quite up to often. Like you said, running up to someone on the street. Running up to like, somebody like, and no it's, one else here is are like you, you. You must not be real. How 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 are you a nerd? <laughs> how, uh, prove prove your nerd credentials and it's like Prove yours. I was like, oh, oh, I forgot it. Oh, didn't you just whip out a middle finger? You know, <laughs> essentially, <I found> yes. <laughs> License and registration, stranger. Essentially, uh, yes. Yeah. And it's it like, hey, I see you're wearing a Legend, Legend of Zelda shirt. How about I just spoil the ending for you? Now go away. <laughs> Never talk to me again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> my sister and I share Legend of Zelda shirts. It's funny. <laughs> It's funny how that you brought that up. <laughs> uh, it, it's so frustrating to like, especially it, not just in video games, but also in television fandoms, in movie fandoms, in comic fandoms, especially Marvel. Um, oh, you have a Nirvana having... shirt? <laughs> Name one of the four noble truths. <laughs> um, but we're talking about like about there being a backlash, about there being like this toxic environment in, especially in fandom and this is definitely regardless of whether or not we want to refer to gamers as a fandom because they're not specifically they're more like a demographic a very angry male t 
pissed yeah, off. Yeah, that's thrilled. that's kind of like saying <laughs> moviegoers are a fandom. <laughs> yeah. If we if, if okay, let's let's just Join refer the fandom. to that as like the fandom environment, but not necessarily specific fandoms. Yeah. It's, but it can occur in fandom in the case of like uh what was it? um oh the Deadpool fandom. Now the Deadpool movie is coming out. There's a lot of defensiveness around Deadpool, especially when the when the director has released like, oh, by the way, Deadpool's pansexual. I want that quoted. He's pansexual. Don't you dare try to stop me from saying this. Yeah, There's... and because Deadpool canonically is pansexual. Absolutely, but this is the same kind of view, idea. It's <sighs> just like that that like Batman isn't. It's like Batman isn't a good father figure, and it's like he totally is. You just have to read and use your eyes. In most universes, because... Okay, the, the canon that we want to talk about that is decent, how's that? Yeah. Th- which is, refers to the same amount of canon that we want to talk about about Deadpool as decent. It's it's but, kinda, it's kind of like religion. We can be selective with canon. <laughs> because sometimes it's bad. And we just <laughs> lost a couple subscribers. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. See you Rest later. Rest in pieces. Meet you, you in hell. Well, um, well... Well, according to them, I'll meet you in we'll the probably be there. <laughs> but... Absolutely, I'll fist fight you later. <laughs> but you already heard us. You're you're damned. <laughs> okay. Okay. Us. Moving on. Um, let's let's move on. We want to talk about Deadpool still no. <laughs> um, Wait. Okay. God damn it. <laughs> Cosmo. <laughs> Chill. <laughs> okay. 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 There, there was backlash regarding the pansexual Deadpool decision, but in this case, it's more like when people are, like, drowning and they're like, there's no water! Ever, ever! There's nowhere ever <laughs> any water! It's like, dude, <laughs> you're wrong. You just have to admit this at this point. There's there's no way that you could possibly ever be right. Mm, but can't... at the same time, seeing that kind of backlash is, like, makes me want to burn every single Marvel shirt I own, except that I'd have, like, two shirts. Oh. And so <laughs> I don't. I just live with it. But <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. Yeah, there's this there's absolutely this toxic concept of they need to keep their masculinity, <laughs> which is interesting because when you think of this sort of toxic masculinity, you think of this sort of concept of dude bros at college and they play sports and they're jocks and they're in fraternities. But no, in this case, it's the people who are, you know, more commonly associated with just like being nerds with. And it's interesting because these are people who talk so much about being bullied and not <laughs> and not liking that and no how kidding. oh gaming gaming needs to stop being put down because gaming is an art form but any time anybody tries to inject anything different into it anything to make it art <laughs> they shut it down it's, they get it's so stagnated. angry you can't make art without letting it be art See, this is the same reason the video game industry is stagnated with toxic ma- masculinity in the same way that the anime industry is to- is just stagnated with toxic a- masculinity. It's the marketing. Mm. It's absolutely, absolutely the marketing. And when we're trying to introduce something that can't be marketed towards what, what video game companies seem to see as the target demographic for these games, we say we want to market a, a video game. Let's just say we want to market a video game towards women that isn't like... like Hello Cooking Kitty. Mama. Cooking Mama. <laughs> that actually did occur to me. I didn't want to say Bejeweled. it. Bejeweled. <laughs> Candy Crush. Marketing a game towards women, or basically anyone besides cis men, is so hard for some reason. We just can't, we just, they just lose their minds. They just, they can't handle it. No one can handle it. It's like, do you have any ideas <laughs> on how to advertise this? No, I'm dry because I'm too used to... You know the concept of hypermasculinity. Let's make let's make <laughs> the exact same straight white male with the exact same haircut and the exact same voice. amount <laughs> of facial stubble, <laughs> yeah. the exact same voice. <laughs> like Hello. he's the same character every every single game, and if, it doesn't matter if you're going from Call of Duty to almost any other game. It's the same character. Okay. One of the interesting things is, if you look into some games, though, they take this character who definitely is that style of character, like Metal Gear. Mm. Metal mm. Gear, you look at that franchise and you think, oh, it's going to be like Call of Duty, it's going to be like all these games. 
But if you actually play it, you realize there is a lot of homosexuality <laughs> and bisexuality and just non-straight. Like, there's a lot of queer people in Metal Gear, including main characters, which is interesting because people don't really get up in arms about that. For some reason. <laughs> For some reason. And I don't, I, I really don't know why that is. I just, um, I stayed up for the um, the midnight release of the Mad Max game, and so that was interesting. I'm gonna get to that in a second, but it was the same night as the Metal Gear Solid release, and um, there was a nice mix of people who were there from Metal Gear and people who were there for Mad Max. And honestly, I wish I'd stayed there for Metal Gear because what happened with the Mad Max game is we took this we took this character who we recently introduced to a fantastic environment and a fantastic set of writers and a fantastic film with a fantastically diverse fan base. And the game is exactly like every other moderately stubbled cisgender male white guy oh. fighting game dystopia ever. That just it is. It, it sucks. Oh, yeah. It's awful. I played the game. It was a complete disappointment because it went right into that trope. And that was the same kind of trope that originally drove the Mad Max franchise, but it's not what's driving it anymore. So why do we have this Absolutely. game? Absolutely, because if here's the thing. If you here's the interesting thing. It's because if you look at the game, the game is focused on Max. Absolutely. If you look at the movie, the movie's not focused on Max. The movie is focused on the brides. The movie is focused on Furiosa. The movie is focused on Nux. Absolutely. It's focused on the other characters. Max is the vehicle, and he doesn't speak much. And that's one of the things about his character, is that through Max, we put ourselves into that story. And that's how you have a vehicle for, for representation. That's how Absolutely. you do that. Because when you make that the character it's, that's the vehicle... <laughs> Be if, if the characters are placing an important role, it's not okay. But when this character is, is how we're seeing that, we can now look at it in a different way. But yeah. when we murdered that with the game, it just lost it lost all all appeal. Well, because you still have that same character in the game, and yet, <laughs> and yet you don't have any of the redeeming stuff. Nothing, it's, and that's it's ridiculous. That's that's like making a Matrix game that's, or making a Matrix movie that's just Neo. <laughs> He's so. So boring. <laughs> I, I must well, admit, that's, you that's are the thing about that's the thing about <laughs> Neo is he has this neutral face, and what he's what he's doing in those movies, what Keanu Reeves in the in those movies is doing, particularly the first movie, is he's creating a template for you to put yourself in, for you to watch the movie through his eyes. But then, obviously, in the later movies, I'm gonna say it does kind of go downhill. I will fight you. I will fight you. I love that series, and I will tell you why right now. Is because the Wachowskis, by the way, the Wachowskis are fantastic, and I think you should watch all yes, of their films. Are. Because Lana Wachowski is my queen, and no one seems to recognize that. And Andy is, like, also amazing and possibly <laughs> the best brother anyone could possibly ever have, and I want him as my brother. They're great. <laughs> Absolutely great. Watch all of their films. Um, <laughs> I... <laughs> There are certain there are certain instances in which the quality did go down somewhat. However, I do admit that overall the franchise is amazing. It's one of the, it's one of the best sci-fi dystopia uh, franchises out there. And it possibly has some of the most meta out there for a sci-fi franchise ever, with the exception of classics such as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, oh, there's definitely. a lot of meta for the Matrix. I read it. It's good. Um, I wrote some of it actually. <laughs> I wrote a very comprehensive meta for um, the Second Renaissance, which was actually not part of the original trilogy. Yeah. Um, it was part of an extension series of yeah. animated shorts. And for can I just say yeah, for those of you who don't know what meta is, it's essentially fan fiction backed up with textual evidence. <laughs> That's a good description of that. <laughs> it's scientifically researched fan fiction. People write basically theses on these works of fiction. It's amazing. Whatever whatever show you're into, whatever content you're into, look up the meta. Try to write meta. We're not forcing it's you great. to do it. We're just encouraging you to improve your do life. It. <laughs> In the future, I want, anyway, continue I want on. Meta written um, out my stuff. Carry on. <laughs> Some of the most interesting things that happened in the Matrix was like how we dealt with the idea of being human, and how that related to the idea of being conscious, being 
a person is different is being a person is separate separated from the idea of being human in a lot of different idea in a lot of different ways and really we don't see that until i believe it's the th third movie yes mm -hmm. When Neo's stuck in the train station, and we don't, like, this is far enough where some people might have gotten lost in the series or just simply stopped watching it, but there is a scene where Neo's trapped in the, in the train station, and he's approached by a family of programs. And that's something that we'd never seen before in the series. And when we talk about these people being people, we have to kind of separate it from the idea of, like, well, are they human? I mean, like, they're a family. They have a family construct. They have a child. Mm -hmm. And they love their child. And that was kind of... That was the defining factor of that family, is the fact that they experienced love. Hmm. And really when it came down to that, it didn't matter that these people were programs. It didn't matter what they were. It didn't matter that they were associated with this other group. It mattered that they were people. And that changed Neil's perspective on what it meant to be a person. And I think that really affected his decisions throughout the rest of the series. In that same kind of manner, we also came to understand that like people like Smith weren't they didn't fall within our perception of pe the people that being people because we'd always perceived smith as being not human and there had been some debate of like well is he a person and the answer at the end of that is no he's not he's a program because he has a goal and he's willing to do whatever it takes to do it he lost his personhood he's also if you there's by the way i'm just gonna plug a particular piece of meta read crack.com like watch watch their after hour specials on <laughs> on the matrix because it gets great and one of the things that i absolutely agree with is that neo and agent smith are really tied in absolutely. that series even in the sense of neo isn't really the one like mm -hmm. neo is part of agent smith yes Agent Smith is actually the one, because Agent Smith is the one who ends up going into the core and ends up resetting everything. Mm. It's, it definitely is his fault, even if it isn't what necessarily He's... what he does. Well, you're Spoiler not wrong. alert. <laughs> oh, sh uh Oh, yeah, like, people haven't seen The Matrix. If you haven't seen The Matrix, you're a bit too late to be joining this discussion. I'm sorry. <laughs> By the way, at the end of the New Testament, Jesus dies. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I was reading that! I never would have gotten that from walking in a, any church. <laughs> I thought it was just a giant T. <laughs> God. Oh, by the way, at the end, you die too. Oh, but you're resurrected. It's fine. <laughs> Um, okay. Okay. That was quite the tangent. Um, we need a commercial break. <laughs> commercial break. break. We're gonna listen to the Beatles for a bit, guys. Just go, go um, listen to the Beatles. Come back, listen to our show some more. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep playing it record. Okay. But, uh, after the Your ears have been neatly graced by the undercurrent of the Geometric Octopus podcast. Anne Boudoir, Cosmo Cavanaugh, Kyle Mitchell, Tracy Medcalf, and our featured guest Klaus McKendry have worked together for many days to bring you this series. Anyone with questions or comments about the show, or anyone interested in submitting a short story or music to be used in the podcast, please email us at geometricoctopus at gmail.com. We would love it if you had any anecdotes about your own experiences relating to gender and sexuality that you would like to share as well. Thanks for listening, and return soon for more Gifts from the Deep. <laughs>